let's dive into the message this morning. Um, we're going to be landing in Colossians chapter 4 if you're making notes or if you have your Bible. So uh, we're, we're not quite there yet, but we'll be landing in Colossians chapter 4. We're in our last week of this series called Hey, That's Me. And what I want to do this morning is I want to lay out for you and give you a clear direction as to where we're going for the next 30 minutes or so. So then we can kind of expect, uh, we can know what to expect. Uh, first off, I want to recap where we've been in the last five weeks. We're going to, I'm going to quickly give to you uh, what Pastor, preached, Pastor Dave preached on in the last five weeks and each characteristic and each individual that we looked at. I want to introduce to you the sixth character that we're going to look at today. And then the third thing I want to do is uh, hopefully clearly lay out for you how that r- relates to us. Uh, how do we become that person or the other five people in 2019? I want to stop right there before I continue on and uh, just have a very real moment with everybody this morning. <laughs> uh, this sermon that I worked on, uh, just to be respectful and blunt, kicked my butt. <laughs> um, it was tough to write, and it was very uh, convicting. I spent about three weeks researching and reading and watching videos and uh, learning and uh, n- no words on paper, and then... Uh, Friday morning, I sat down, and two hours I wrote it, which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, but it was tough. And so I'm speaking this uh, in love, and I'm speaking this uh, really to myself, and hopefully that as I talk to myself, everyone else will listen. <laughs> no one else does sometimes. <laughs> so in week one, we listened to Pastor Chris from King Carden share with us about uh, how there's no... Uh, this isn't a cruise ship. There's no deck chairs on this boat. How we all have a role to play. Uh, we all should be picking up a paddle and rowing. And as we do all that, we should do all of this in love. And we read from uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the whole love chapter in the Bible, where uh, we, we need to show love to our community. Paul continues on a few chapters after that uh, in 1 Corinthians 16, where he says, In everything do love. That was week number one. In week number two, we looked at uh, the caregivers, and we read of the instance of the Pool of Bethesda, and uh, we we looked at the character who just naturally gives care. This is the person that has a natural tendency to see the hurt and the needy and the sick. This is a person who has a natural ability to see someone who needs food or maybe someone who needs a ride home or someone that just needs a listening ear and and company in their home. Uh, This is a person that has a natural, uh, just, they are naturally caregiving. Uh, And really, we should all be this way, because that's how Jesus is. We should naturally be caregivers. If we're Christ followers, we're caregivers. And the words that Pastor Dave used was that, yes, we should all be this way, but there are some that are uniquely wired to do that better than others. There are some of us that are naturally gifted and uniquely wired to be amazing hosts. Uh, I'm going to pick on Nicole Nickerson for a moment. She's a volunteer in our in our youth ministry, and uh, she has the gift of um, just making food things happen (laughs) in the youth ministry, which I'm very thankful for. Um, And and there was one night that I had set up this 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 stuff on the counter over there, this food stuff, and and uh, I was trying to make it easy on her, so I kind of took care of it and. She walked in, and she was kind of surprised that I had done a pretty decent job, and I kind of patted myself on the back and said, yeah, I can, I can do it. But she is, I, I allow her, I, I ask her, I let her, I give that to her because she does an amazing job with the hosting. We all should be able to host. Some are naturally more gifted than others. When it comes to caregiving and, and that whole idea, Pastor Dave said this, we don't need a committee to do this. We don't need to meet on Monday night and decide who's going to do what. He said, just go and do it. Just go, love, care, help. In week three, we heard about Barnabas, uh, which wasn't even his real name. We read in Acts chapter four how, the, how his name was Joseph, but the, everyone else called him Barnabas, which is translated to mean son of encouragement. And so Barnabas was the encourager. Barnabas was a person that, that saw people that needed to be brought in and needed to be uplifted and needed to be supported, and he, and he did that. We, we read about how Barnabas uh, helped bring Paul into the fold, more or less. If you don't know who Paul was, Paul killed Christians, plain and simple. 
And then Paul is trying to get into the community of faith and he's trying to prove it himself and he's trying to look into the other Christians and say, I don't do that anymore. I'm one of you. I'm here to teach and preach and, and lead. And Barnabas puts his arm around, arm around his shoulder and says, come with me. And he brings him into the fold. We don't hear much about Barnabas. We hear a ton about Paul. But if it wasn't for Barnabas, would Paul be there? Probably, because God can do amazing things. But Barnabas encourages and brings people in. Another characteristic of Jesus, Jesus was this way. Jesus loved the outcasts. Jesus invited them in and welcomed them in to be part of the community. Again, we should all be this way, but some of us are more uniquely wired than others. In week four, we learned about the intercessors, and again, this is a characteristic of Jesus. If we're striving to become like Jesus, if we're Christ followers and disciples, and that's our end goal, then we should all be this way. Again, you're going to hear this over and over and over today. Some of us are more uniquely wired and geared to be intercessors than others. But let's be reminded of what an intercessor is. An intercessor is a person that sees someone and says, I know you, and I know your need. This isn't a perfect stranger. This is someone that knows, I know Ken decently okay. (laughs) Some of you I don't know. I'm not going to go to you and say, I know you, and I know your need. But rather, I'm going to go to Ken, and I'm going to say, Ken, I know you, and I know your need. And I know Jesus, and I know what he can do for you. The intercessor connects the two. Oftentimes, the intercessor stands in the gap and prays when somebody doesn't have the energy to do it anymore. The intercessor says, I know you, and I know what you need, and I know Jesus, and he has the power to meet that need, so let me connect the two of you. The intercessor is a person that is praying for and standing, oftentimes, emotionally and spiritually and mentally and physically with and for that person. The intercessor, I don't know what's going on. The intercessor is a prayer warrior because oftentimes we don't have the need or or the strength to pray for ourselves. I honestly don't know what's going on. Sorry. Amen. Amen. When we talk about intercessors, here's the truth. The intercessors need the caregivers in that loop. We all have to work together. The intercessors can't pray for something they don't know about. The encouragers can't stand with somebody, encourage them, and support them, and lift them up if they don't know what's out there. Yeah, and so we can't. We can't do this alone. If we're not picking up a paddle beside someone else that's picking up a paddle, what are we doing, folks? Keep going, because that's helping. (laughs) In week five, we heard about how the disciples made more disciples again and again and again. We focus on Timothy and how he was being poured into. And so adults in the room, who are you pouring into? Which of the younger generations are you pouring into? Teenagers and younger ones, who are you pouring into? There's a bunch of kids upstairs right now. What are you doing to pour into them? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to feed on that all morning long, so just deal with that. Thank you. The bottom line is everyone has a part to play, and everyone has a role on this boat, and if we're not picking up a paddle, you're doing something wrong. Which brings us to week six. Week six is going to be, uh, you might feel it might be a a little bit of a narcissistic uh, week because we're going to be talking about Andrew. Uh, My name is Andrew, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you didn't hear that, she says, I wonder why you're weeping. <laughs> if we look at the Gospels, we read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that Andrew was, quote unquote, just a fisherman called by Jesus, which he was. If we dive into the Gospel of John a little bit more, we read more of Andrew. Andrew was already a disciple of John the Baptist, he was already a man of faith, he was already a, a student of, of, the, of the teachings. Of, of the Hebrew law. 
So there's already that understanding of, of God and faith and all that stuff. When John the Baptist recognizes Jesus as the Messiah, Andrew was the first one to say, I'm going to follow that guy instead. And with the blessing of John the Baptist, Andrew goes and follows Jesus. Andrew is given the credit of, as being the first one. Andrew also brings his brother Simon, which we, we let later learn is, is named Peter. In John 1.42, it's where Jesus renames Simon to be Peter. Some scholars believe that at this time, Andrew and Peter uh, are going back to work now as fishermen. They're, they've chosen to follow Jesus. They're one of his uh, uh, disciples. They're, they're a student of his, but they're going back to their career. They're going back to the job because that's all they know. We read in, 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 in the Gospel of John that the calling of Andrew and Peter when Jesus calls them, come follow me. The, some scholars believe that that is when they have fully decided to leave their career and follow Jesus. When we hear of Andrew, we, all, we often think or we often read that he, was, he seems to be always on the fringe. He never made the top three disciples. When you hear the disciples, the first ones that come to mind are Peter, James, and John. Andrew is often listed as number four. Uh, when, I, when I read that, when I thought of that, this came, this came to my mind. And I think that's important to consider that he was often on the fringe. He was often on the outside. I think he held a special place in the group, being the, the first one, being the, the first guy to decide, I'm going to go follow Jesus. But I like to think that Andrew's place, which was on the fringe, was a strategic place. Because on the fringe, you can see more. When you're standing on the, on the fringe, on the outside, purposely, you can see not just one individual, but all the individuals. You can see the, the grander scale. You, you have a 10,000-foot a view of situation rather than a 100-foot view of situation. Andrew was, I believe, was a person that sat, sat with his back to the wall so he could see everything. When I was growing up, my dad taught me that. My dad was a police officer, if you didn't know. And uh, whenever we went to restaurants, he would always choose a seat with his back to the wall so he could clearly see every exit <laughs> uh, and everyone coming in and any, any troublemakers that might be in the room or, or whatever. I've adopted that whenever we go to a restaurant. Nadia sometimes picks a seat that she knows I want. <laughs> uh, but I always have to sit with my back to the wall and just observe everything and, and just see everyone just in case. Because Andrew calmly watched, he was able to see someone that needed to meet Jesus, and when he did that, he then brought them to Jesus. We see this example in two places, and they're both involving another disciple uh, named Philip, and I think it's important to note that Philip was a Greek, as was Andrew. The first example is when Jesus fed the 5,000 in John chapter 6. Jesus asked Philip, what are they going to do? And he's asking Andrew this as a test Sorry, he's asking Philip as a test. What are we going to do to feed all these people? Philip freaks out. I don't know. <laughs> Andrew is also a little concerned, but he sees a boy with five loaves and two fish, and he brings him to Jesus. He was aware of the need. He saw the opportunity, and he invited the boy into the community that involved Jesus. The second time we see Andrew and Philip together is in John chapter 12, and in the verse 20 we read how uh, some Greeks paid a visit to Philip, his buddies, his classmates, his, his whatever, and they wanted to see Jesus. And Philip's first reaction was to go ask Andrew. Andrew was a calm one. Andrew was a sensible one. Andrew had all the answers. Andrew had, didn't have all the answers. And so Andrew then goes to Jesus and presents a request to Jesus. And we don't read uh, that Jesus denied the Greeks, so it's safe to assume that Andrew helped introduce Jesus to the Greeks. Andrew brought the boy with five loaves and two fish to Jesus. Andrew brought the Greeks to Jesus. Andrew brought people to Jesus. Any light bulbs going on yet? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to do it? I think it's wise here to stop as well and, and quickly take a look at some or, not, or if not all, not all, but a lot of the disciples. 
and the personalities. We talked about the first five weeks and all the different characteristics, the caregiver, the intercessor, the encourager. Something that we all should be able to do, but some are very uniquely wired to do these more than others. And the disciples were the same way. If we look at uh, Andrew, the quiet one, the Peter, or Peter, the hot-headed one, you read of James and John, they're called the sons of thunder, which comes to mind like a wrestling team. Luke was a doctor. Matthew was a businessman. Thomas, we all know who Thomas was, the doubting one, the one with questions, the one with doubts. For good reasons, but he's, he's a questioning one. And so each of these disciples had different qualities, and each of these disciples were very uniquely wired in their own special way. But they're all disciples of Jesus, and they all aimed and strived to have the same characteristics as Jesus had. Regardless of their different qualities and different characteristics, and whether they asked questions or they didn't, I mean, heck, let's look at Judas. Judas denied Jesus. How many times have we denied Jesus in some way or another? Each of them had a different quality, and each of them were uniquely wired in different ways. But regardless, their goal, except for Judas, because we all know what happened to him, the disciples made other disciples. They went and traveled and led people and brought people like, like Andrew did to Jesus. They showed compassion and care. They interceded. They encouraged. They taught. They led. They fulfilled their mission, which we read in Matthew 28, was, which is to go and make disciples. And so what does that mean for us? What does it mean for us in 2019 to go and make disciples? What does it mean to live a missional life that follows after the disciples' mission? I think it's safe to say, and I firmly believe that it is biblical for the mission of all Christ followers, is to do just that, to go and make disciples. We are to live missional lives. Does that mean that we are to become all missionaries? Yes and no. <laughs> Let me explain the confusion of that answer. What does it mean to be missional? Let me start off by saying what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we do random acts of kindness just because. It doesn't mean that we uh, do random acts of kindness and we think they're while we're doing it. Well, there, I just show God's love to that person and everything's all good because now they know who that God loves them. It doesn't mean that we do random acts of kindness to feel better about ourselves. It's not even about doing deliberate, not even random, deliberate acts of kindness because even unbelievers do deliberate acts of kindness. Even unbelievers collect food for the needy and go visit with people. To be missional is not saying, I'm going to pray for you and then just walk away. We in the Western church love to use a quote from St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Don't we? However, in the words of author, theologian, and missiologist and teacher Michael Frost, he says the only people who ever quote that are people that don't use any words. He goes on to say that we live our lives as Jesus would. We love people, we care for people, we do good, but we don't say anything that is not missional. Another missiologist by the name of David Bosch says this, of course words are necessary. Unexplained deeds in themselves do not constitute the mission of God. We in the Western Church have, for a long time, have loved the idea of being a seeker-friendly or attractional church, where we look at everyone and say, come here, come here, come in, we have this, we have that, come, 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 come. And there's been a shift for the last little while that we need to start saying, we're going to go out. We're going to go in our community. We're, we're not going to water down what we teach, we're not going to... We're not gonna, um, twist or we're not going to just change things we're going to still preach the gospel but we're going to go into that community and that community and that building and that office as michael frost put it there has been a rediscovery of incarnational living of trying to do divine acts of service of working towards being peacemakers of showing demonstrations of justice of building friendships in our community 
There has been this push towards doing what we can to cross property lines and our fences in our backyard and sharing our lives and our resources, our time. And if we do all of that, which is phenomenal, I'm not downplaying that at all. It's needed, it's necessary, we have to do those things. But if we do all of that and we do not articulate, if we do not communicate, if we don't verbally speak the name of Jesus, it's all for nothing. So what is the mission of God that we are to live? It is to go and make disciples. It is to go and bring people, as Andrew did, to Jesus. So the questions I ask are, is your act of service making disciples? Is your act of justice making disciples? Is your act of making peace making disciples? Is your sharing of what you have making disciples? Or are we doing it just to feel good about ourselves? Does this mean that you have to stand on a park bench and wave your Bible and preach the gospel? Does it mean that you need to start sharing your faith in a, in a public venue? Does it mean that you need to start to yell down fire and brimstone? I've been watching a lot of independent fundamental Baptist videos on Twitter. <laughs> God bless them. The answer to all those questions is yes and no. Because the bottom line is some of us are uniquely wired to go stand in the middle of Sable Beach and preach the gospel and evangelize. And some of us are not uniquely wired to do that. Colossians chapter 4. The book of Colossians was written by Paul <clears throat> while he was in prison. He was writing to a, the church uh, that he had never met, and he was re- writing to a church that he had not started. The church in, in Colossae was being tempted to compromise and fall back in their old ways. And so he's writing to them, trying to encourage them, remind them of of how we're supposed to live our lives as Jesus directed us to be or to do. And at the end of the book, chapter 4, Paul is asking for prayer. Paul is asking for prayer, he says, for us. 4 verse uh, 3, pray for us. So he's grouping himself in the category of missionaries. And in this context, he's asking for prayer for all missionaries, the translocal ones, the ones that are traveling long distances, uh, and, and the local ones, which... We read at some, in the Gospels, or we read in the New Testament, uh, Timothy would have landed in the, in the category of a local missionary. In 2 Timothy 2, uh, or 2 Timothy 4, sorry. He's asking the church of Colossae to pray that they, the missionaries, have three things. The first thing is that he's praying that they have opportunity. Opportunity to preach the Gospel. The second thing is that he's praying that they are bold in these opportunities, that they don't hold back. And the third thing is that they're praying that they have clarity to get the message across. Now, if Paul assumed that every single Christian were to fulfill those three things, he would have continued on by saying, now you go and do the same thing. But he doesn't say that. He says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and thankful heart. So he's telling everybody to pray. He's saying, pray for us, the missionaries, that God will give us many opportunities opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Some other translations mention the boldness in there as well. Verse 5, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. So he tells them to pray that we, the missionaries, have opportunity that we're bold, that we're clear. But then he looks at everyone else and says, now for you, you be wise in how you act towards strangers. You be hospitable, you be welcoming, you be open and inviting. He says, make the most of every opportunity to have social relationships. The third thing is, he says, be graceful in every conversation. The fourth thing is, know how to answer. And so Paul is saying that some are called to be evangelists. Absolutely, he's saying that. And those of us that are called to be evangelists, the rest of us need to pray for them like crazy. Those three things. I think Paul firmly believes that there are people who are uniquely wired to have bold conversations with people at the coffee shop and people in the grocery store and people on the beach and people on the street and people at the mechanics and people everywhere else we go in this world. 
This is the time of the service that you could be saying, hey, that's me. I'm that person. I'm that bold, crazy, wacky person that can talk to strangers about Jesus. If so, great. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know how the intercessors can join you. Let us know how the encouragers can join up behind you and, and encourage you and support you. Let us know how the caregivers can care for you and, 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 and help you in that way. Because we're all rowing on this boat together. Quick reminder, our mission is to go and make disciples. As Pastor Dave preached last week, we are to be disciples making disciples making disciples making disciples. But that requires us in some way or another to evangelize. I personally am not wired to evangelize in the way that we all think of standing on a soapbox and being a Billy Graham in Port Elegant. I, that's, that's not me. I'm not uniquely wired to be that way. Evangelism for me and evangelism for most of us will be how we speak to Jesus or speak about Jesus to our neighbors, to our friends, to our co workers. It will be in how we respond to people's questions. As he, as he said in, in verse, uh, verse 6, that your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone, so you'll have the right answer, you'll know how to answer. When people ask, what, why, when, where, how, whatever other W I missed. Our response should be Jesus. Paul wrote to the Colossians, we should be ready to have answers. Paul wrote, or sorry, Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, always be prepared to give an answer. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy, be ready in season and out of season to give an answer. Three times that I've read it, I probably missed a few more that we're told to be ready to answer for how we're living. The evangelists, the bold ones, they need our prayer. They covet our prayers. And we need to pray that they seize every opportunity. We need to pray that they're bold in those opportunities. We need to pray that they are clear when they're talking to anybody about Jesus. We need to be ready to answer people's questions about Jesus, which implies and begs the question, are you living a questionable life? Oftentimes, my mind did anyways, are, that kind of went to the negative. Am I living a questionable life? Let's spin that positively. Are you living a questionable life where people are starting, starting to question who you are and who your faith is in and why you live the way you live? Are people asking uh, are they asking us how and why we are so hopeful and joyful? Are they asking us, and are they curious why we live the way we do? Are people flabbergasted? I always want to put that in a sermon. Are people flabbergasted with our attitude and our behavior and our words and our actions and our habits? If we are constantly trying to keep up with the Joneses, if we're trying to, always trying to meet the status quo, how are we living differently? Yes, God has blessed us. He has provided for us. But there should be some semblance, there should be some physical representation that we're living differently to our neighbors and to our community. I'm a history buff. <laughs> I apologize if you're not. There's one member of my family who isn't, so I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> I'm going to go a little bit historical on you if you don't mind for a second. Love history. It's important to look at, at Christian history at this point, and, and just as I wrap this up very quickly, I apologize. It's important to look at history and see just the, the context. In the fourth century uh, Roman Empire, there was an emperor named Julian the Apostate, and Julian the Apostate hated Christians. He, he, he tormented, persecuted, killed, made rules and lists and everything else so that they couldn't practice their faith. He's known for hating Christians. He's known for converting to the pagan church. However, while he did all that, he was also incredibly terrified of the Christians because he, he was fearful that they, they would cause him to lose the empire. See, the Christians were, were living as we should by love, simply loving people. And because Christians loved their other Roman civilians and friends and, and community and neighbors those Romans were converting and, and joining the faith 
and joining the community of their Christian friends. Julian sent out a directive to all his leaders, to all his council, to his entire empire, and he said, if we do not stop these Christians from doing, I'm paraphrasing, I don't speak old Roman language, if we don't stop these Christians from doing these wacky, crazy, out-of-the-box things, we're going to lose control of our people, we're going to lose our empire, we're done, we're, we're finished. What were they doing? Were they preaching in public squares? No. Were they holding a revival tent meeting in the Colosseum? Absolutely not. Were they holding political parties to, to come up against the Roman Empire? No. Julian's biggest concern is that the Christians were just simply loving people. His words were this, these impious Galileans not only feed their own poor, but ours also, and they welcome them in. These impious Galileans were feeding those that needed food, whether or not they're part of their community, whether they're part of their neighborhood, whether they're part of their blood family, whether, whether or not they're part of their faith community, they were feeding those that needed food, plain and simple. These impious Galileans were tending to the graves of those that weren't their own. When I read that, when I studied that, they crossed a religious line there. They joined, they didn't join a community, but they, they assisted and they helped those that didn't believe the same thing they believed because it needed to be done. They were showing true and genuine hospitality. They were treating their women as equals, their slaves as brothers. When we read Colossians and we read uh, Philemon or Philemon, Phil, 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 yeah, that's the one. Phil, we'll call him Phil for right now. You'll read, <laughs> oh boy, You're, I, sometimes I wonder why Dave has me up here. You'll read how Paul charged the church to treat each other with love and how we treat our wives and our families. We read that in, in an, a lot of the New Testament. This is what the impious Galileans were doing. They were just simply loving and treating each other with love. Julian the Apostate makes this huge list of all the terrible, evil things that the Christians are doing. I think it's important to understand the Roman Empire well, as well at this time. Why were the Christians loving their wives and treating them as equal? Because in the Roman Empire at that time, a man had three women in his life. He had a wife for sons, he had a, a, a concubine for sex, and he had, can I say that word right now? Is there no, no little ones in here? And he had a, a mistress for public outings. The Roman Empire did not treat their slaves as brothers. They treated them lower than dirt. The Roman Empire were terrible at running hospitals and hospices. That's part of hospitality. <laughs> they couldn't even do that. And along comes the Christians following Christ's examples, doing what he told us to do, and people were being fed and people were being healed, healed from hospitals that sprang up from the Christians. And, and needs were being met, and women were equal, and slaves were brothers. Lives were being changed. The Christian message was that all are welcome no matter what you've done, no matter where you've come from. We're here to share what God has given us. We sh will share our food and our drinks and our homes. Julian says we're going to lose control if we don't stop them. And so Julian charges his empire, and his governors, and his everyone in charge, and he says this, he says, Here's what we're going to do. We're not going to stop them, but we're going to do better. We're going to outlove the Christians. And so hospitals sprang up, and food started to appear, and all these people were being cared for, but the Christian faith kept on growing more and more and more. Because love is not a strategy. To love someone isn't a checklist that we just check mark and away we go. To show, to show true agape love, which we heard of in week one of this series, it's about having the Holy Spirit inside of us and having that flow out and help and love and give and serve and meet the need. How Christians lived in the Roman Empire under Julian the Apostate was so weird and so opposite, it was so countercultural that people started asking questions. So this week today, can we say, hey, that's me? Can we say that those words when we talk about the evangelist seizing and being bold and being clear? And if you can, then find the encourager, find the intercessor, find the compassionate caregiver, the disciple maker, and each and every one of us are connected. Or can you say, hey, that's me. I'm living a very questionable life in a good way. <laughs> 
then continue on and go and do what we're called to do. And bring, as Andrew did, bring and go and bring people to Jesus. Don't bring people to this building. As much as we love this building, and as much as we need this building, and as much as we, we're th- thankful for this community and everything else, it's about Jesus. So go and make disciples and go and help people learn who God is. Go and be Jesus. Be the compassionate. Be the intercessor. Be the disciple maker, the connector to your community, wherever that is, in your workplace. I always feel strange as a pastor saying, go to your workplace and connect people to Jesus because, I mean, there's only like five of us upstairs. Go and change the world by showing the world who Jesus is. Go and live a very questionable life, causing people to ask you who you are and why you are the way you are. We're very much aware that we live in a world of hate. So we are to go and show love. Love the earth and the environment. Love your neighbors. Love the outcast, the one in the corner alone that is sitting by themselves with a very nonverbal sign that says, no one loves me, no one wants me. Go and love them. Part of loving others is, let's be the voice for the voiceless. These are all the values of the kingdom of, of God. And when we, God's children, Christ followers, disciples, start to live a life like that, when we live so bizarre and so different to the culture that we're in, it will be the most natural thing for people around us to start to ask questions. And so in the words of Paul, I pray that we will be able to answer whoever we come across with boldness and clarity and be ready to answer in any moment of any day. Let's pray. Father God, my prayer this morning as we wrap up God, my prayer is this, is that as we pull out of this parking lot this afternoon, as we go home, as we go to our neighborhood, as we go to the restaurant, as we go to the grocery store, will you place someone in our path that will ask us a question? God, we pray for the evangelists in the room. Some I know, some I don't. God, together this morning, we corporately pray for them. God, give them opportunities to share your name. God, we pray for boldness and strength to be imparted to them. That they will not back down, that they will have courage to explain who you are. And God, give them the words and the clarity that only your Holy Spirit can give. That they will be able to very clearly and understandably communicate who you are and why you came. And God, for those of us that are not saying, hey, that's me, I'm an evangelist, will you lead us to continue to or even start to today, start to live questionable lives so that more people will be drawn to you God, may we, as we leave here today, keep our eyes fixed on you. The defender and the perfecter of our faith. May we continue to strive to live for you. Pray us all in Jesus' name. Amen.